Thanks for joining me for this introduction to BioExclude. My name is Pete Mariner and I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at Snowasis Medical. In this presentation, I'm going to go over the basics behind tissue procurement and processing, as well as the regulation of placental allografts. I'm going to spend a little time talking about the structure and function of placental membranes, focusing on the relevant biological properties of these tissues. I'll also reach back into my past and pull out some of the data that I collected while working in the field of biomaterials and tissue engineering in order to describe the cellular processes involved in wound healing and how these are relevant to the procedures that you commonly perform in your practices. I'll conclude with a discussion of PRF and the underlying biology of autologous blood products. In doing so, I hope to provide you with a fundamental understanding of the differences between bioexclude and PRF as a way of helping you to make informed decisions about your treatment options. Placental allograft membranes are being used in a wide range of wound healing applications. Their unique physical and biological properties make them ideally suited for even the most challenging environments. To better understand why these membranes are having broad success and rapidly increasing clinical adoption, it's useful to examine the underlying biology of these membranes and their primary function during pregnancy. In general, placental allografts refer to membranes that are derived from the amniotic sac. As shown in this illustration, the amniotic sac consists of two main membranes, the amnion and the chorion. The amnion is the innermost membrane with an epithelial layer that lines the inside of the amniotic sac. The chorion is the outermost layer facing outward towards the uterine environment. As you see in the diagram, both the amnion and chorion membranes are composed of a series of distinct tissue layers, each of which provides important physical and biological properties to the amniotic sac. The amniotic sac is, first and foremost, the physical barrier between the mother and developing child, performing the critical function of protecting the child throughout pregnancy. In addition to possessing a unique combination of strength and flexibility, the amniotic sac possesses unique biological characteristics that help to protect the pregnancy. The amniotic sac employs cloaking mechanisms that effectively hide the developing child from the mother's immune system. The placental membranes also express antimicrobial factors and immunomodulatory cytokines that serve to prevent infections and inflammatory conditions within the uterine environment. And finally, as would be expected in any rapidly growing and developing tissue, the amnion and chorion membranes contain a plethora of active growth factors. Placental allograft tissues are procured using strict guidelines put forth by the American Association of Tissue Banks and the Food and Drug Administration. Potential donors are identified as healthy women undergoing elective cesarean sections at the end of full-term pregnancy. With full consent of the donors, placental tissues are collected at the time of child delivery, allowing the tissues to be collected and maintained within a sterile environment. All donated tissues are thoroughly screened for microbiological and viral pathogens in accordance with AATB and FDA guidelines. BioExclude is a deepithelialized and dehydrated amnion chorion membrane created with a patented purion processing method. Following procurement in a sterile environment, the amniotic sac undergoes a gentle cleansing and washing. The epithelial layer of the amnion is removed to expose the basement membrane, allowing for better cellular attachment. The spongy intermediate layer that sits between the amnion and chorion is also removed to facilitate the dehydration process and the remaining amnion and chorion layers are placed back together to create an amnion-chorion laminate. Following dehydration, the membranes are cut into defined dimensions and placed into individual packets where they are terminally sterilized and packaged for distribution. The unique physical properties of bioexclude result from the complex extracellular matrix compositions of the amnion and chorion sublayers. Whereas the basement membranes provide barrier function and support for cellular layers, the compact and reticular layers provide elastic and tensile strength that allows the membrane to stretch and bend without failing. The fibroblast and trophoblast layers don't contribute significantly to the physical strength of the membrane, but instead these layers contain most of the soluble factors that are attributed to these membranes, including antimicrobial peptides, growth factors, and cytokines. The antimicrobial activity of BioExclude can be clearly observed in the following in vitro experiment in which a small disc of BioExclude was placed onto the surface of a blood auger plate immediately after spreading a culture of bacteria evenly over the surface. 
When the plate is incubated at an optimal temperature for bacterial growth, the bacteria grow and divide, creating an opaque lawn on the surface of the auger. As can be seen in this image, the bacteria lawn is not present around the bioexclude disc. Instead, a zone of inhibition is created in which the bacteria have not been able to proliferate. This experiment provides evidence for three important conclusions. First, bioexclude contains factors that inhibit bacterial growth. Second, these factors remain active through the purion processing step used to make bioexclude. And third, these antimicrobial factors are soluble and able to prevent bacterial growth at a distance from the membrane itself. Though it's likely that multiple factors are involved, beta defensins are thought to be important contributors to this effect. Beta defensins are short, positively charged amino acids that are expressed naturally in infection prone tissues, including the respiratory tract, the reproductive tract, the oral cavity, and of course, placental membranes. Beta defensins are active against gram negative and gram positive bacteria, as well as enveloped viruses and fungi. One way that they are thought to kill bacteria is shown in the illustration on the bottom right. Here you see beta defensins embedding themselves into the membranes of bacteria and assembling together to effectively punch holes in the membrane and kill the bacteria. Bioexclude has also been shown to contain over 300 soluble growth factors in cytokines. The activity of these factors has been demonstrated in cellular assays, proving that the purion process is compatible with biologically active factors. Moreover, many of these factors are known to play critical roles in wound healing, including cellular proliferation, angiogenesis, stem cell recruitment, matrix deposition, tissue remodeling, and immunomodulation. The list shown here was taken from a primer on placental membranes and regenerative healing published by Memetics which I would recommend to anyone looking for additional information on the science behind placental allograft. A common question that Snoasis gets from those who aren't familiar with BioExclude is whether or not BioExclude is an approved FDA product. And the answer to that question is a bit nuanced in the fact that the FDA does not have a quote-unquote approval process for transplant tissues. When new products are brought to the FDA for consideration, they're classified into the basic categories of drug, biologic, device, or ACTP. ACTPs, or human cells, tissues, and cellular and tissue-based products, are regulated under the Public Services Health Act, which was enacted in 1944. If the ACTP is determined to be, one, minimally manipulated, two, intended for homologous use, three, not combined with other agents, and four, not dependent upon the metabolic activity of living cells for its primary function and not having a systemic effect, it will be regulated under Section 361 of the Public Services Health Act, meaning that it must be registered with the FDA, not approved. HCTPs that don't fit these criteria must follow more standard approval processes. Noasis can say with great confidence that BioExclude is a Section 361 HCTP. The purion process fits the FDA's view of minimal manipulation, and when used as a barrier, protector, covering, or separator, BioExclude fits the homologous use criteria put forth by the FDA's guidance documentation. BioExclude is not combined with other agents, and BioExclude's function as a barrier membrane does not have a systemic effect, nor is it dependent upon metabolic activities. The reason we can say this with great confidence is that we've had multiple interactions with the FDA's Tissue Reference Group, or TRG, which is the center responsible for establishing the jurisdiction and applicable regulations of HCTPs. The TRG has instituted a Rapid Inquiry Program, or TRIP, to provide an informal assessment of the FDA's opinion regarding how specific HCTPs should be regulated. To date, Snoasis has submitted seven trips to the TRG, all of which have confirmed that BioExclude is a 361 HCTP when used in socket preservations, sinus perforations, guided bone regeneration, guided tissue regeneration, non-surgical periodontal procedures, and as protective covers for both tooth extraction sockets and soft tissue donor sites.
An overlooked attribute of bioexclude and amnion chorion allograft membranes in general is the presence of intact basement membranes. Basement membranes form natural tissue barriers and are found throughout the body, serving as the main delineators between distinct tissue types, including epithelial layers, blood capillaries, muscle fibers, and adipose tissue. Composed of a well-organized matrix that's rich in collagen 4 and laminin, basement membranes are the natural substrate for epithelial cells created by and for the epithelium. Importantly, the matrix components of basement membranes provide environmental cues to cells, effectively orienting them within complex tissue. To explain how basement membranes provide signals to cells, it's useful to take a step back and review how growth factors activate responses in cells. In this illustration, a cell is depicted in which common molecular signaling cascades are diagrammed to indicate how the binding of growth factors to their membrane receptors activate signaling pathways within the cell. As depicted in this figure, these cascades create an entangled web of signaling pathways that ultimately converge on the nucleus, where changes in gene expression lead to changes in cell behavior. Each of the red block arrows is pointing to a receptor that's embedded in the membrane of the cell. When growth factors bind to the receptors, the receptors change conformation, resulting in the activation of signaling pathways inside the cell. This mechanism is illustrated in the image on the lower right, in which a soluble factor, in this case, epidermal growth factor, or EGF, is shown binding to its receptor embedded in a cell membrane. Upon binding of EGF to its receptor, the complex dimerizes with another EGF receptor complex, causing a conformational change that activates the internal domains of the receptor that in turn activate downstream signals inside the cell. What's hidden in plain sight in this illustration is the presence of integrins, which are also embedded in the cell membrane and, like growth factor receptors, can activate cellular signaling cascades. Integrins don't bind soluble factors. Instead, they bind to the extracellular matrix. When bound to the ECM, integrins also undergo conformational changes that result in the activation of signaling inside the cell. The downstream signaling of integrin-mediated pathways feeds into the complex web of signals being received from the external environment, contributing to the final messages that are converge in the nucleus. The internal domains of integrins also attach to the cell's cytoskeleton, allowing the cells to use the attachment of integrins to the ECM to generate the mechanical forces that enable cellular spreading and migration. Because integrin pairs bind to the extracellular matrix, and in doing so activate signaling cascades within the cell, integrins are effectively the eyes of the cell, allowing the cell to see structural components in its surrounding environment like photoreceptors in the back of the eye that send signals to the brain upon receiving specific light wavelengths, integrins send signal to the nucleus upon binding to specific components of the extracellular matrix. Integrin receptors are formed by the dimerization of alpha and beta subunits, with 18 known alpha isoforms and 8 known beta isoforms. There are over 100 unique integrin pairs. Each alpha-beta dimer creates a specific binding pocket providing integrins with tremendous versatility in what they will and will not bind to in the ECM. As shown in this illustration, one set of alpha-beta combinations will bind specifically to fibrinogen, whereas a different set of pairings will bind to laminins, and yet another set of pairings will bind to collagens. Of course, this is an oversimplification of the specificity that integrin pairs possess, but the idea remains that signaling from distinct pairs creates different signaling patterns on the inside of the cell. In this way, cells are able to quote-unquote see where they are and act accordingly. This idea becomes extremely important when considering the biological advantage of de-epithelialized amnion chorion membranes like BioExclude. Epithelial cells like those of the gingiva are uniquely tuned to identify the extracellular matrix proteins of basement membranes as a way of orienting themselves within the body. This becomes particularly important in wound healing environments where basement membranes are often damaged or missing altogether. To understand why amnion chorion membranes are uniquely suited for periodontal procedures, it's useful to take a step back and review the four basic phases of wound healing. 
At the time of wounding or tissue damage, the first phase, hemostasis, begins with platelet activation and clot formation. As platelets spill out of damaged capillaries and blood vessels, they activate and release coagulation factors that initiate fibrin clotting to stop blood loss. Platelet activation also results in the release of growth factors and cytokines that initiate the second phase of wound healing, inflammation. Factors released by platelets recruit neutrophils and macrophages that arrive at the wound site and begin the process of disinfection, actively killing perceived pathogens and clearing debris from the area. With the site cleared of pathogens, the wound enters the proliferation phase, depicted in panel 3, in which fibroblasts and myofibroblasts begin to deposit a provisional granulation tissue in the wound bed. At the same time, epithelial cells at the edge of the wound undergo a phenotypic transition in which they begin to spread, proliferate, and migrate over the damaged area in an effort to close the wound. Finally, when the epithelial layer is reestablished and a new basement membrane is created, also known as wound closure, a remodeling phase ensues in which the underlying granulation tissue, as well as the initial basement membrane, is continually refined through a process of controlled breakdown and redeposition of the tissue. While these phases of wound healing are depicted as distinct stages, the processes involved form more of a continuum in which the phases overlap as the wound progresses into and through the remodeling phase. That said, a delay in any one of these phases will cause a delay in the subsequent phases. For example, the presence of an active infection will result in an inflammatory response, and as long as the infection persists, local wound healing will be unable to proceed into the proliferation and remodeling phases. The phases of wound healing are dictated by the cells that are involved. Though technically not cells, platelets kick off wound healing when they spill out of the vasculature and come into contact with ECM proteins. This results in the activation of platelets, causing them to initiate homostasis and release factors that recruit inflammatory cells. In this way, the platelets are the first responders for wound sites, where they stabilize the environment and call in the special forces. The arrival of the special forces, or neutrophils, initiates the acute inflammation phase. Neutrophils express and release cytokines that amplify inflammatory reactions and recruit other cells. They also perform critical antimicrobial activities in an effort to clear the wound of foreign bodies and infectious agents. One of the cell types that neutrophils recruit is circulating monocytes, which undergo a differentiation process to become macrophages upon arrival to the wound. Macrophages are effectively the ground troops, responsible for a lot of the dirty work of cleaning up the wound, including engulfing and digesting debris, foreign bodies, and microbes. As the preliminary threat subsides, macrophages will create signals that move the wound out of the acute inflammation stage and into the proliferation phase where fibroblasts and epithelial cells go to work. Fibroblasts are the rebuilders, responsible for building granulation tissue by depositing collagen and other ECM components. They work with macrophages to clear and remodel wound sites as wound healing progresses. Epithelial cells are the sealers, responsible for closing the wound. The cells undergo a phenotypic transition and begin proliferating and migrating over the wound, depositing new basement membrane to seal the surface of the tissue. Following wound closure, fibroblasts, macrophages, and epithelial cells continue to work together through an extended remodeling phase in which the body attempts to return the tissue to its native state. This remodeling phase is not perfect, resulting in what is called scar tissue. To show these processes in more detail, I've borrowed some videos and data from Mosaic Biosciences, a company that I helped found in 2009 to develop biomaterials for wound healing and drug delivery. Mosaic uses a proprietary polymer technology to create degradable scaffolds for cells and tissues. In the quick video on the left, you'll see an example of this photopolymer technology in which a monomer solution is added to a mold and polymerized rapidly by exposure to 385 nanometer light. As a demonstration of these materials' ability to scaffold cellular migration and proliferation, we would set up what we called cell invasion assays. In the experiment shown in the video on the right, human dermal fibroblasts were seeded into a collagen plug, which was then encapsulated in our material. 
Using light microscopy, we were able to observe cells migrating out of the collagen plug and into our polymer, as shown in the time-lapse video. When used in a full thickness skin wound model, our polymer system made it very easy to capture snapshots of the wound healing process. In this model, full thickness wounds were made in the backs of pigs and the polymer was applied as a liquid and then cured in place using a 385 nanometer light. When the wound was excised and sectioned for histology, the samples provided invaluable information about how wound healing cells interact with different polymer compositions, allowing us to optimize formulations for specific applications. In this histology section, you can see a clear delineation between the native tissue with its tightly organized collin fibrils in dark blue and the wound with its combination of reddish granulation tissue and translucent purple polymer. Upon closer examination, neutrophils can be observed moving into the polymer, creating channels as they march forward into the material. Notice how, in special forces fashion, the neutrophils move aggressively forward, securing the area in preparation for the ground troops consisting of the macrophages and fibroblasts, who will follow behind and rebuild the tissue. In this histology section, taken from a different study, healing has progressed significantly further than in the previous example, providing insights into different aspects of the wound healing process. Looking at the top surface of this wound, a thick neutrophil layer is observed. As neutrophils progress through the wound, they ultimately reach the top having cleared out everything behind them. At this point, they collect at the top of the wound and begin to undergo a form of apoptosis, which results in them spilling their DNA into the surrounding environment. The long strands of negatively charged DNA that spill out of these cells entangled into what are called neutrophil extracellular traps, or nets. These nets are part of the neutrophil's infection fighting mechanisms because they're able to capture bacteria, preventing them from infecting the wound. In a deeper section of this sample, the buildup of granulation tissue can be observed. Macrophages work diligently to clear the way for new tissue deposition, while fibroblasts begin to rebuild the extracellular matrix by depositing collagens, which stain dark blue in these sections. As the granulation tissue matures, new blood vessels are formed by angiogenesis, as indicated by the red streaks of neovascularization that can be clearly seen throughout the depth of the wound. The initial phases of reepithelialization can also be observed in the histology section. The leading edge of the epithelial layer can be seen stretching out over the top of the granulation tissue and under a layer of neutrophils and fibrins. What appears to be aberrant epithelial layers diving below the wound surface are actually remnants of the initial reepithelialization efforts, which tend to track the edge of the wounded tissue. This tendency is highlighted in the following examples. The tendency of the epithelial layer to initially dive towards the depth of the wound is more easily observed in the following two examples where a different polymer formulation was used. In this first sample, you can see that the searching epithelial layer is migrating downwards as if attempting to go underneath the polymer. In another sample, taken a few days later, the neutrophils have made significant progress invading into the polymer, and the beginnings of granulation tissue are starting to show. At this point, the epithelial layer stops migrating downwards and changes course following a path between the neutrophils and the granulation tissue. The takeaway here is something that I think that you are all keenly aware of. That is, the natural tendency of epithelial layers to invade treatment sites. It's not difficult to imagine a scenario in, in which sockets filled with bone graft will experience the same process as displayed here, which drives the use of barrier membranes to guide reepithelialization and wound closure. Bioexclude, as a natural barrier membrane, is uniquely suited for wound healing environments. Placed as a protective cover of our wounds, Bioexclude not only serves as a physical barrier that prevents pathogens and debris from entering the wound environment, its antimicrobial factors can limit the establishment of infections that would cause a delay in healing. Importantly, as epithelial cells begin to migrate away from the wound edges, they will be likely to encounter the Bioexclude membrane and the subsequent activation of integrin signaling 
will alert the cells to the presence of the basement membrane. This will have two important effects on the cells. First, the migrating epithelial cells will naturally form strong connections with the bioexclude membrane, effectively sealing the edges of the wound by recreating a continuous basement membrane over the defect. Second, the presence of an intact basement membrane will facilitate the re-epithelialization by providing these cells with a structural foundation that they would normally be forced to recreate de novo. Following wound closure, the bioexclude membrane will be naturally remodeled over time through the continual process of enzymatic degradation and new tissue deposition, leading to its coordinated removal and replacement by new tissue. Because BioExclude is a relative newcomer to the field of biologically active membrane products, we're often asked how it compares to PRF. To understand the regenerative properties of PRF, it's useful to understand platelet biology and platelet function. Platelets are small vesicles that bud off from megakaryocytes and travel in circulating blood in an unactivated resting state. Several different kinds of platelets are produced, each with specialized functions in wound healing. Aggregating platelets contain membrane receptors that bind to the extracellular matrix of tissues. When injury occurs, and these platelets come in contact with ECM, they activate, causing a dramatic change in their morphology, as well as making them sticky to other platelets that will then begin to accumulate and activate at the site. When this occurs, Procoagulant, coded, and secretory platelets are captured in the network and begin to release factors that strengthen the clot with fibrin and activate inflammatory processes that will recruit cells to clean and repair the damaged tissue. Basically, platelets are the first responders and they secure the area and call in for medical help. Before talking specifically about PRF, I thought it'd be useful to look generally at blood fractionation and PRP. When whole blood is collected in the presence of an anticoagulant, it can be centrifuged to create distinct cellular and acellular fractions. Upon centrifugation at 1600 times gravity or 1600 times G for 15 minutes at room temperature, three obvious layers can be observed in whole blood. Iron-rich red blood cells packed to the bottom of the tube while white blood cells and unactivated platelets pack into what is called a buffy coat that sits just on top of the red blood cells. Acellular plasma is the lightest fraction and floats above the cellular layers. To create PRP, the buffy coat is removed along with a small amount of the plasma layer, resulting in a four to six fold concentration of the platelets over that of whole blood. In the clinic, PRP can be used in two ways. The first is direct injection into tissues or joints. Upon injection, the unactivated platelets will contact the ECM of the tissues and activate, releasing the growth factors and inflammatory cytokines that are attributed with PRP's therapeutic benefits. When making PRP gel, thrombin and calcium must be mixed in to allow the platelets to activate so that coagulation can occur. In these cases, the therapeutic factors are released into the fibrin clot and then transferred to the patient within the gels. PRF is different from PRP mainly because no anticoagulants are used and platelets are allowed to activate naturally, releasing their clotting factors and growth factors and cytokines in the process. Centrifugation is used to remove red blood cells which are quickly pelleted even at slower centrifugation speeds. As the clot forms and creates a fiber network in the upper layer, white blood cells are captured in the matrix, allowing them to be transferred to the site with the PRF clot. Several variations of PRF exist, the most common of which are probably LPRF and APRF. LPRF, or leukocyte-rich PRF, is basically created with the steps that I just described and uses the L to stress the fact that white blood cells or leukocytes are entrapped in the clot. APRF is a newer iteration of PRF in which a very low centrifugation speed is used to prevent white blood cells and platelets from separating from the plasma layer. In a 2018 article, Shokran and Gennady showed that reducing centrifugation speeds increased the number of leukocytes and platelets caught in the resulting fiber network, 
which also corresponded with an increase in growth factor content that could be soaked out of the clots. So, how would PRF be expected to perform in a wound healing environment? Compressed into membranes, PRF can be placed over the wounds as a protective cover to limit pathogens and debris from entering the wound. The acute inflammatory signals that would have been released from platelets during clot formation will act to recruit neutrophils and macrophages to fight infection and initiate subsequent wound healing mechanisms. As first responders to the inflammatory signals released by platelets, neutrophils secrete enzymes that specifically degrade fibrin, allowing them to access the wound and fight infection. Neutrophils arriving at the PRF membrane will begin to degrade it, which likely explains why these membranes are thought to have short residency times within wounds. As migrating and proliferating epithelial cells begin to close the wound, they must recreate the basement membrane from scratch, which is an energy-intensive process that will limit the rate of re-epithelialization. By the time the wound reaches the remodeling phase, the PRF will be long gone. As a way of summarizing the similarities and differences between BioExclude and PRF, I've assembled this table to compare the key attributes of these products side by side. Because PRF is essentially a fibrin clot that's naturally degraded by neutrophils, its ability to function as a barrier is going to be limited. In comparison, BioExclude is a natural tissue barrier that will be recognized as such and will be slowly remodeled following wound closure. Although BioExclude is an allograft tissue, the fact that it's sourced from placental tissues, which are inherently immune privileged, minimizes any risk of immunogenicity. Only BioExclude has intact basement membranes with antibacterial, antifungal, and antiviral factors. Both PRF and BioExclude contain active cytokines and growth factors, but the ratio of these factors are tuned for different functions. The cytokines and growth factors secreted by platelets that will be present in PRF are tuned to elicit acute inflammatory responses, whereas the soluble factors present in BioExclude will be tuned for tissue growth and development as well as the prevention of excessive inflammation. When considering the convenience of PRF and BioExclude, there really is no comparison. PRF requires venipuncture and bedside preparation to create a membrane that must be used that day. BioExclude is an off-the-shelf product with a five-year shelf life. Finally, we're frequently approached by clinicians who are concerned about the potential for graft-to-graft -graft variability. While there may be minor donor-to-donor -donor differences, the fact that only tissues from healthy full-term pregnancies are accepted for bioexclude membranes ensures that the source of the tissue is not compromised in any way. It's also important to realize that the donor tissue is technically from the baby and not the mother, meaning that all donor tissue is effectively zero years old at the time of collection. In addition, the purion process used to make bioexclude involves highly repeatable preparation steps, ensuring maximal product reliability. In contrast, when looking at the potential variability of PRF, several sources of concern must be considered. First, donor health can negatively affect platelet function, which would impact product function. Similarly, donor age, which can range from 18 to 100 years old in the case of PRF, has been shown to affect platelet function and growth factor content. PRF compositions can also be affected by phlebotomy technique, sample handling, and centrifugation methods. And with that, I'll conclude this introduction to BioExclude, and thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation. I hope that I was able to provide you with some insight into the biology behind amnion chorion membranes and how these compare to platelet-based products, especially within the context of wound healing. I've provided my email address here with the hope that you will not hesitate to contact me in the future if you have questions or comments that weren't addressed in this session.